Hi, I'm Kaylee Whalen, and I'm proud to co-produce this video with my friend and fellow transgender activist, Eric Tannehill. So this video is gonna be based on research from subject matter experts about techniques to survive conversion therapy for trans and non-binary youth. So Eric, can you tell folks a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hi, my name is Eric. I'm a trans man. I use he, him pronouns. Um, in about 20 days, I'm moving to Canada to start my life as a university student, and I'm very excited. Uh, <laughs> and I would like to make it clear that I am not personally someone who has survived conversion therapy. However, like Kaylee said, everything in this video has been very well researched, and we have to talk to multiple experts in different fields. Everything that is said in this is at least in some way accurate, and hopefully we can use this to help people. Thanks. Why we're making this. Conversion therapy is increasingly being used on trans youth, which is awful. It doesn't work and is considered harmful and unethical by every major health organization in the US listed here. Studies show conversion therapy doubles the risk of suicide for trans people, meaning trans adults who underwent conversion therapy are about twice as likely to have attempted suicide as those who didn't. Right now, unsupportive parents of transgender youth are collaborating online to help find conversion therapists for their trans and gender nonconforming kids. The goal of this video is to give trans and non-binary teens the tools needed to effectively protect their mental health. What a conversion therapist is trying to do. Conversion therapists come in several flavors. Ones who try to convince you to stop being trans because it's sinful. Ones who think that you're trans because of some sort of trauma. Ones who think it's due to internalized misogyny. And ones who will try to convince you that you should just learn to suffer untreated gender dysphoria because it makes you a better person. Initially though, they will pretend to be on your side and that they accept you and that they're concerned for you. The goal is to get you to talk and then use what you say to hurt, shame, or gaslight you into agreeing with them. Ultimately, they want you to doubt or hate yourself so much that you renounce your gender identity and never take steps towards transitioning. They want you to believe that this is the best path for you and your family. Luckily, the techniques I'll be describing here apply to any of these conversion therapist types. Where these resistance techniques come from? The techniques we'll be discussing come from the historical experiences of POWs. Conversion therapy shares some similarities with the friendly style of interrogation, which is actually the most effective. These situations are similar in the sense that in both conversion therapy and POW camps, you have someone involuntarily being questioned that can be punished for providing answers the interrogator doesn't like, such as being shipped to a worse camp in our POW example, or in our case, a for-profit troubled teen facility. You may need to spend the summer here. I know this can be daunting, so just remember, unlike military interrogations, the conversion therapist cannot beat you or have you executed. They only have 55 minutes per session instead of hours, and they stop getting paid if you stop seeing them. We use these differences to our advantage. What you are trying to do. Your number one goal is to mentally protect yourself. Conversion therapy is essentially an attempt by a stranger paid by your parents or guardians to gain your confidence and then decide for you how you identify and who you should be. What? The only acceptable outcome to a conversion therapist is that you aren't trans and will not transition. Your goal is to give them nothing they can use to hurt you. Your resistance should be subtle enough that you don't get punished for not cooperating. So how do you do that? What your strategy is. First and foremost, you're trying to run out the clock on every session without giving them any information that they can use against you. Long meandering non-answers, bathroom breaks, playing dumb, misdirection, and strategic use of questions directed at the therapist are all your friend. You can seemingly be cooperative and responsive while providing nothing of value. Stony silence, angry outbursts, insults, and other actions that seem hostile to the conversion therapist will probably cause the end of therapy sessions with them and increase the odds of you getting shipped off to a wilderness program or a for-profit troubled teen program, where the conversion therapy will continue in a worse prison-like environment. First thing to do is establish if they are a conversion therapist. So. You came out voluntarily just so there are no secrets between us anymore. I'm a girl. Or involuntarily. 
Not even gonna ask. And your parents or guardians dragged you to a therapist you've never met before. Can you trust them? Figuring this out is surprisingly simple. Conversion therapists will rarely use your preferred name and basically never use your preferred pronouns unless they match your sex assigned at birth. If you suspect you are being put in front of a conversion therapist, request that they use a preferred name and pronouns. Virtually any legitimate therapist will respect this basic request by a patient. If the therapist does use your preferred name and pronouns, it's probably safe to talk to them more openly and you should work with them. If they refuse, either start using delaying techniques immediately. They are not your friend, no matter how nice they seem. They are there to convince you that you are not trans and nothing you could say or do would cause them to accept your identity. Don't even try. About the techniques. You need to mix them up and switch between the different techniques we've discussed. You can even combine them. For example, you're feeling so tired that you give long rambling answers that go nowhere. Don't use any of them too often or the therapist might catch on to what you're doing. Generally, don't only use them as soon as a tough question comes up because that will tip them off on what things you don't want to answer. Instead, use long, thoughtful pauses, ask for clarification, or use rambling non-answers. If you go to the bathroom or get drinks of water every time they ask a big question, they'll inevitably figure it out. The goal is to rotate through the different options as needed to prevent the therapist from figuring it out. Data. Fluctuate phase or resonance frequencies. Random settings keep them changing. Don't give them time to adapt. Technique number one. Exploit their desire to build rapport and keep you talking. Avoid answering direct questions. Don't tell them anything important or emotionally valuable. Instead, take advantage of this by answering questions with long, rambling stories about random, unimportant stuff that go nowhere. It's easy to run off the clock this way, and trans youth who have been put in co coerced conversion therapy have successfully used this technique. When you get asked a question, drag it immediately into the weeds with segues like, that's really interesting, good question. It kind of reminds me of my cousin Steve, who always used to drink a can of Coke before, mm -hmm. and just keep going like that. It's one of the best tools in your arsenal. If you need inspiration, look at this clip of Grandpa Simpson. Nichols had pictures of bumblebees on him. Give me five bees for a quarter, you'd say. Now, where were we? Oh, yeah. The important thing was that I had an onion on my belt, which was a style at the time. This is just about the perfect example to take a conversion therapy session off the rails. The key is that it distracts in a way that gives the listener hope that it might come back eventually, but it never does. Don't use this too much though, as a smart therapist will eventually catch on to what you're trying to do. Technique number two, request a bathroom break. This one's pretty simple. If the questioning becomes too much or you need a minute to yourself, any reasonable therapist should grant you this request. If they do deny you a break, and that means no party breaks, continue to repeatedly insist with growing desperation that you need one. Claim you can't think or answer their questions because you need to use the bathroom so badly. Say it hurts holding it. As soon as they realize they won't get anything useful out of you, they should let you go. Technique number three, play pain, sickness, and fatigue. Let's be honest. Teens have been playing sick to get out of school since the beginning of time. This is my ninth sick day this semester. It's getting pretty tough coming up with new illnesses. If people think you are sick and they're not COVID idiots, they won't want to sit trapped in an office with you. Always exaggerate how tired, sick, weak, or injured you are. You can use it occasionally to duck out of a session entirely if you know that one's coming up or provide slow, lethargic, monosyllabic answers to questions using something like, I'm really very sorry, but I feel terrible, couldn't sleep last night, have a splitting headache, and I just couldn't have the energy for this. Should be a ticket out of any sane therapist's office. A coughing fit just to ramp up the tension doesn't hurt either. Don't overuse this though. They will catch on, but keep it in your back pocket to get out of a session or avoid it altogether if needed. Technique number four, exploit their desire to build rapport by engaging on things you don't actually care about. It's actually better to talk about a favorite sports ball team when you couldn't possibly care less about any sort of sports ball because it gives the impression that you do, leading them to make incorrect inferences in the early session 
The conversion therapist will be working hard to build a rapport and may go along with this in the hopes that it will get you to open up later, even though it definitely won't because you don't care. As long as the therapist is talking, you're saying nothing, running out the clock, and you won't seem hostile in the process. It's almost as good as silence at ensuring you say nothing of value to the therapist with none of the drawbacks. Remember, it doesn't have to be sports ball. It can be anything, fashion, a TV show, a movie, a subject in school. As long as you think you can get the therapist to talk about it in the first place and therefore waste time, it doesn't matter. Just to think of something and get them to talk. Technique number five, play stupid. One of the most spectacularly successful techniques ever used by an American POW to avoid interrogation was to play dumb. Doug Hegdahl was seemingly friendly and helpful to a fault and pretended to be too stupid to understand anything but the most basic commands of his captors. Seriously, look up his story. It's amazing. When you're in with a conversion therapist, you can run down the clock by always asking for clarification. I don't understand the question. Can you explain that a different way? I'm a visual learner. Can you draw a picture? What do you mean? Pretending to misunderstand the question and then giving answers that don't address the real one also buys you time. Just remember, this is an expert level technique and a difficult one to pull off convincingly. If you're a straight A student pretending to be illiterate like Doug Hegdahl did, that probably won't fly. Think it through before using this technique, but it can definitely be useful. And even if you don't commit to playing dumb, you can still occasionally ask a clarifying question as a way of wasting time. Technique number six, misdirection. Conversion therapists really want to get into your head and make you doubt yourself or accept that spending your life in pain is what's best for everyone. Your job is to keep them away from the part of your life that is LGBTQ+. In Vietnam, POWs would tell their captors things that they knew their captors already knew. Likewise, when you're not babbling like grandpa, you can talk about things that aren't really the problem. Saying, my math class is hard and stresses me out, can we talk about how I should handle that, is basically like putting out bait for therapists. Drag out this discussion as long as possible. It also potentially offers a chance to work on things you actually want to work on. In fact, some of the conversion therapists are weird enough they might think that helping you deal with mass math will make you not trans. No, don't offer up anything that could remotely be blamed for making you LGBTQ+. Talking about math class is okay. Divorce, death of someone close to you, or even friend drama are a no. They'll try to blame your queerness on this. Technique number seven, long thoughtful pauses. Sitting in sullen defiant silence isn't a great option. It can actually make your situation worse if they decide to give up on you and send you to troubled teen camp. However, taking long, thoughtful pauses to compose yourself, consider your options, and choose a response in line with the techniques presented here is an effective way to buy time. Comfort yourself, remember your strategies, and think of a good answer that works in your favor. A therapist will rarely push you to answer quickly, and if they do, push back with, I was thinking, and that disrupted my train of thought. Give me a moment, please. We never say anything unless it is worth taking a long time to say. They generally won't punish you when you're appearing to be cooperative by putting time and thought into therapy. She's got health. Technique number eight, maintain a support network. The goal of conversion therapists and parents or guardians working with them is often to cut you off from the world and anyone not actively working to undermine your sense of identity and worth as a queer person. Having people to help recenter yourself is crucial Try to maintain a support network, and failing that, you can always call the Trevor Project Crisis Line at 1-866-488-7386. If you let them know you're a teen who has been involuntarily placed in conversion therapy, they will make time for you. If you can, use a friend's phone to avoid having your parents or therapist checking your call history. Technique number nine, remove yourself from the situation. 
If you are truly considering self-harm, go to the nearest emergency room. Tell them your situation with suicidal ideation, a plan to act on it, conversion therapy, etc. Emphasize that you do not feel safe at home. Seeking out an ER, preferably one that doesn't belong to a religiously affiliated hospital, and asking to be put in inpatient psychiatric hold is something you only should do if you are truly at the end of your ability to cope. Some parts of the psychiatric community remain hostile to trans youth. While there, your goal it should be to ensure that you do not return home. If you are sent back to your parents, there is a non-trivial chance you will be sent away to a troubled teen camp until you turn 18, which will only make your situation worse. Things not to do, number one. Do not use violence, aggression, anger, threats, yelling, or anything else that makes you seem difficult or dangerous. Don't let your grades plummet or do anything destructive or criminal. That's a one-way ticket to a wilderness camp or a for-profit troubled teen correction facility somewhere in the Utah desert. If you thought life sucked at home, going to where they won't let you be openly LGBTQ+, talk with friends, can put you in solitary, forbid anyone from addressing you with your preferred name and pronouns, refuse medically necessary care, have frequent conversion therapy sessions, and only give you food you can't eat is way, way worse. Things not to do, number two. Do not tell them about anything important about your life or anything that is even the least bit stressful or traumatic that ever happened to you that they can blame your trans or non-binary identity on. Their goal is to use this against you. One of the most common techniques used by conversion therapists is to find something traumatic that happened in your past, no matter how minor or how long ago, and use it to blame your queerness on. If you confess, you were sad when your pet goldfish died when you were four and they don't have anything else to go on, they'll try to use this as the reason why you're LGBTQ+. Things not to do, number three. Do not talk about anything LGBTQ plus related or gender non-conforming with the therapist. One of the most successful strategies friendly interrogators use is to get the subject talking about the subject of interest in a general sense, and then just letting them go without asking any actual questions. The conversion therapist is either interested in your trauma or how you got sucked into the trans cult. Some even believe manga and anime make kids trans. The reason you're plunked down in front of a conversion therapist is because you're LGBT. They want to draw you out to attack the validity of that identity. The further you stay from the subject they want you talking about, the better. If they try to drag you back to the topic, use the techniques described earlier to avoid it. Things not to do. Number four, don't lie and avoid half-truths. Conversion therapists will try to catch you in these and use them against you. They can serve as proof that you're a pathological liar or suffer from some other disorder and thus need a harsher treatment. Remember, they are incentivized not to send you off because they're making anywhere from $60 to $150 an hour while you're babbling about nothing in their office every other week. As long as that babbling isn't a lie. I can resist no longer. I shall tell you the truth. The truth is... Oh, that outfit really isn't working for you. Things not to do. Number five. Don't go stone cold silent. If you are too uncooperative, they will eventually wash their hands of you and may write up a diagnosis based on your silence that will allow your parents to ship you off to a troubled teen camp. If you go silent at specific points, it will tip them off as to which questions make you uncomfortable and hone in on that. In that case, I challenge you to a battle of wits. For the princess? To the death? I accept. Things not to do. Number six, do not attempt to engage in a battle of wits, reason with them, or prove anything to the conversion therapists. It's already been found by multiple reputable sources that trans and non-binary identities are valid and conversion therapy does nothing but harm people. These therapists aren't swayed by every major psychiatric association in the U.S. They won't be swayed by you either. They can't be reached with logic, so don't bother. They professionally gaslight kids like you, eight hours a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year. They coordinate with each other to overcome any rhetoric or ideas you might come up with. 
They will draw you out and then go for the psychological jugular to cut your reasoning and facts to ribbons and then undercut your sense of self-worth efficiently and effectively. It's what they do for a living. Do not try to play their game. The only winning move in this game is not to play at all. Hi, thank you for joining me and Eric Tannehill for this video. If you found it helpful, please take a moment to like and comment below and share it so other people can see it. Also, to get notified of future videos, please take a moment to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Thank you for joining us.